All right, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, the 2018 uh, Joanne Goodman Lecture Series. Uh, my name is Frank Schumacher. Uh, I'm a member of the history department here at Western. There are two organizational details before we get started. Uh, this year's lectures uh, and uh, uh, the subsequent discussions will be recorded and posted in the events section of the Department of History's website. Secondly, I should also mention that there is a sign-in uh, sheet for students who need confirmation for their attendance. With that out of the way, let me say a few words about the lecture series and introduce this year's speaker. The Goodman Lecture Series explores the histories of uh, Canada, the United States, and the United Kingdom uh, often in their Atlantic context. For more than 40 years now, every fall, a distinguished historian is invited to deliver three public lectures to the university and uh, the London community. The endowment also supports the publication of these lectures and uh, a number of uh, very good books have uh, been published uh, out of these lectures. The series was established in 1975 by the Goodman family of Toronto in memory of their elder daughter, um, uh, Joanne, who was a second year history major uh, here at Western, uh, and she died in uh, a highway accident. We're most grateful for this endowment from the Goodman family. Our speaker this year is Professor Elaine Tyler May. Dr. May is a Regents Professor of American Studies uh, and History and Chair of the Department of History at the University of Minnesota. And she is uh, one of the most uh, distinguished cultural historians of modern America and she is past president of both the Organization of American Historians and the American Studies Association. Elaine Talamay has published widely, these are some of her books, and I'll uh, just read a few titles here, Great Expectations, Marriage and Divorce in Post-Victorian America, Pushing the Limits, American Women, 1940 to 61, Barn and the Promised Land, Childless Americans in the Pursuit of Happiness, and of course, I guess uh, uh, it doesn't hurt to call it a classic. Homeward Bound, uh, American Families in the Cold War Era, and it is a classic. America and the Pill, The History of Promise, Peril, and Liberation, and finally, Fortress America, How We Embraced Fear and Abandoned Democracy. The overarching title for this week's uh, lectures is States of Fear, how a quest for security has eroded democracy. And our first lecture today will be on sex, women, and the bomb, Cold War domesticity. Please welcome Professor Elaine Talame. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Frank, for that very generous introduction. It's a great pleasure to be here, and I look forward to having a conversation with all of you about issues that I think we're all um, engaged in. The, the talks that I'll be giving here have, I think, some resonance to the world that we all inhabit here in North America. Um, and so I really look forward to hearing from all of you and to um, widening my own perspective uh, by engaging with um, students and citizens and faculty of, of Canada. So I was reminded of that this morning when I looked at the newspaper in, in Canada, um, which was completely filled with the news uh, of the, the trade deal. The trade deal has certainly been on the front pages of American newspapers as well, um, but overshadowed by the catastrophic drama of what's going on with the Kavanaugh hearings and investigation. And so just seeing how media um, addresses the concerns of the people in our two countries as close as we are, uh, we get a lot of different perspectives. So for me, it's really a privilege to be here uh, and to be able to learn from all of you as well. So, Sex, Women, and the Bomb 
to begin a three-part lecture series on basically on fear with sex, women, and the bomb might seem a little bit odd, but I think that the way in which our, our cultural images and our cultural ideas are embedded with all kinds of meanings, that if we kind of dig into them and pick them apart, we can get some insight into things that don't always seem to be related to each other, but once you kind of pull them out and, and look at them together, we find interesting things to say about them. So this, this was the case in this investigation that I did looking at the early years of the Cold War. And I'd like to share some of that with you today and get your reactions as well. So I'd like to start with this image of a young family, I'm not gonna lean on this, <laughs> of a young couple uh, by the name of Marvin and Mr. and Mrs. Marvin Minenson, as they were identified in the, in the papers. Uh, this is a Life Magazine story called The Sheltered Honeymoon. And this couple, as you can see, they're sitting in front of their um, modest suburban home with the lawn filled with consumer goods of all kinds. And they are about to embark on their honeymoon. And their honeymoon um, is going to take place in the fallout shelter. You can see up in the far right hand corner the entrance next to the portable toilet that's going to accompany them on their romantic uh, honeymoon. Um, they are going to spend their honeymoon in this, in this fallout shelter for two weeks of uh, what Time um, Life, Life magazine called unbroken togetherness. And here they are descending for their two week honeymoon. Um, now I think this is a wonderful symbol of the nuclear family in the nuclear age. Now, obviously, I think this was probably the only couple that spent their honeymoon in a fallout shelter. And it was, of course, a publicity stunt. And decades later, there was a follow-up to the two of them in the um, Bulletin of Atomic Scientists, where they were interviewed and their children were interviewed. They were still together. Their children thought they had the weirdest honeymoon ever. Um, and they said that, you know, it was a publicity stunt and they did it because um, the magazine promised them or the construction people of this shelter promised them a real honeymoon in Mexico, all expenses paid. So, you know, it, it wasn't just that this was really how they started their marriage. But I think it's a very telling symbol of the idea that getting married and starting a family is somehow connected to the fears of the era, to protecting yourself against the dangers of the outside world with thick walls and protection for the security of yourself and your emerging family. And so I think it's a kind of telling symbol, even though it was probably the only one of its kind. Nonetheless, it got a lot of publicity and it, it said something about the moment in 1959 when this couple got married. And as you can see, they're young and they are embarking on this uh, romantic adventure inside a fallout shelter for, for two weeks. Really? But yes. So what is going on during this time period? Well, we know this was at the peak of the baby boom. And as you can see from this chart here, the birth rate was declining pretty dra dramatically in the United States, starting in about 1800 and going pretty steadily down until about 1940, when the birth rate began to turn around. And notice that the birth rate begins to rise, not after World War II, but actually during World War II. And this bump that we see here is the baby boom. And it declines by the late 60s, where it picks up to where it probably would have been if there had been no baby boom at all. And what caused the baby boom, and I think it's important to think about this, is not that suddenly people were having huge families. They were maybe going from an average of two to an average of maybe three. But they were getting married young, very young, like the Minnesons, 
they were largely they were teenagers you know the age of marriage was about 19 for women 21 for men at the time and they were marrying young and having their children young so by the time they were in their late 20s most of them were done having babies and lastly and this is I think most important almost everybody was doing it the marriage rate was going way up along with the birth rate and because it was such a mass phenomenon because almost everybody married at this time and married young that's what produced the baby boom and that was a real change from the years of, of the Great Depression where the marriage age went up and the marriage rate went down and of course World War II when there were a lot of delayed marriages but nonetheless marriages were happening when the depression ended and children were born now the other thing that's interesting about this time period even though it's associated with women's domesticity is this bottom line here is the percentage of the total of married women who were actually employed outside the home so curiously we go from a situation where the vast majority of married women were not in the paid labor force all the way really through the 1930s and then it starts to climb in World War II and continues to climb after World War II so you have this curious phenomenon of young marriage a baby boom a massive rush into marriage and at the same time an increase in the number and percent of married women in the paid labor force many of them taking time off when their children were born but going back to work at least part-time when their children were in school and the domestic ideology of the time which was very much uh, a white middle-class ideology had to be supported by generally by the income of the wife contributing to the income of the husband to be able to afford the good life that post World War II America was broadcasting to the world so what else is going on during this time well there's this is a a, a look at the annual divorce rate and you can see that as the birth rate was declining in the late 19th century the, the divorce rate was going up it jiggles around during the first couple of decades of the 20th century then there is a peak at the end of World War II in 1946 you see that big peak when a lot of wartime uh, marriages or marriages that did not survive the separations and traumas of the war fell apart so there was that peak in 1946 but then look what happens the divorce rate goes way down and during the 1950s it actually declines pretty dramatically and stays pretty low until the late 1960s and then it skyrockets and if we look at this another way the dots are the proportion of marriages that will end in divorce and the the solid line is sort of the predictive smooth curve so what you see here is that during the 1930s marriages that were um, formed during the late 20s and 30s ended up in divorce at a larger um, with a larger percentage of marriages than the curve would have predicted but then after World War II starting in the mid 40s right when the war ended the proportion that ended in divorce as you can see those dots are way below the curve those indicate that the marriages that were formed in the late 40s and early 50s actually remain intact at a greater level than would have been predicted so you see how the divorce rate is reflecting not just a kind of standard pattern of a certain percentage of marriages are going to end up in, in divorce court but real changes during these years that can be traced to particular kinds of historical developments and then you see that starting in the late 60s and into the 70s the dotted line is above the curve and uh, there are more divorces than that line would predict so what we see is that we have a time period after World War II where there's high rates of marriage low rates of divorce low marriage age for both women and men and early childbearing and lots of babies 
lots of babies. So here is a typical nursery. Now what's different? Let's take some clues from the popular culture. So we're going to look back a little bit to the 1930s and look, and look specifically at the relationship between men and women, the way the family is portrayed, and, and the politics that surround it. So here is an interesting still from a film called His Girl Friday, which was an adaptation of a play in which the main character, whose name was Hildy Johnson, was a man. And in the film, which is early 40s, in the film, Hildy Johnson is turned into a woman. Now, what we see here is she's the heroine of this film. She's the protagonist. She's divorced. A divorced woman as a protagonist. You're not going to see this after World War II. And her boss is her ex. And she's a professional woman. She's a journalist. And she's tough. And in this particular scene, she is protecting a man who is being accused of being a communist. And you can just see how scared he is, how weak he is, how frail he is, how undangerous he is. And she is the strong woman who fights off the mob. It's a lynch mob after this guy. She is protecting him from the anti-communist lynch mob. Now, by the end of the film, she and her ex end up back together, but she's not quitting her job. They've just kind of figured out a way to make it work. But I think these are, you know, just even in this one film, in this one still, we see a lot about gender and the popular culture, and this was a very popular film, that disappears after World War II. And we start getting very different messages. Now, where does sexuality become dangerous? Well, in some cases, sexuality has always been dangerous, but often, in the cultural world, the danger of sexuality out of control was associated with men, particularly with black men. But after, during and after World War II, we start getting female sexuality as dangerous. Why? Well, in part because World War II and the aftermath of World War II opened up the public arena to women and opened up and freed their sexuality in many ways. And so we start getting associations of women, sexuality, and danger showing up in the culture. And I think one of the most interesting places we see this is uh, what was called nose art in World War II, where pilots decorated their planes with images of sexy women. So here you see, I mean, not just one, but like hundreds of planes were decorated with these kind of erotic portraits. And I was interested in this and I called the Smithsonian to see, you know, if I could get hold of one of these pictures of nose art from World War II. Did they have any? And I talked to the curator of photography and she said, uh, World War II nose art? I said, do you know what I'm talking about? Have you heard of this? She said, like, we have hundreds of those pictures. <laughs> what, you know, what are you looking for? And I just said, well, I don't know, just pick one and send it to me, which she did. Um, and you know, I find it fascinating that these are bomber planes and that bomber pilots are decorating their, their planes with um, images of sexy women or nude women or whatever. I mean, here you see it. Um, does anybody know, by the way, what was on the, the, what was decorating the bomb that was dropped on, I think it was on Nagasaki, not on Hiroshima. Anybody know what it was decorated with? Sexy picture of Rita Hayworth on the atomic bomb. You know, there's, there's just no accident here. These, these, these aren't random, you know. If you have hundreds of, um, you know, there were contests even hundreds of planes decorated like this, and then the atomic bomb. Something in the culture is associating female sexuality with catastrophic danger. Catastrophic danger, okay? But it's not just, you know, the images. Here we have a government poster, and there were many 
during World War II, warning men what might happen to them if they have too much sex on the brain. So here's a poor soldier. Is your mind diseased? Many warnings during World War II aimed at the soldiers saying, uh, you know, if you're too preoccupied with women when you're off the base or you have some time, leisure time, stay away from them. They will rob you. They will have sex with you and leave you diseased with venereal diseases. You won't be able to go home to your wives and sweethearts. You won't be able to fight for, for your country because you'll be sick and weakened and stay away. So here too are official messages to men um, who are warned that women are going to be dangerous and to stay away from them because they might cause them harm that will ruin their lives. Now, there's other things going on during the war that are going to become even more powerful after World War II. And one of them is homophobia. We know that World War II was the first war in the United States where gay men were allegedly not allowed to serve. We also know that many did. But the official policy was gay men and women were not allowed to be fighting for the United States because they were considered to be weak, to be considered deviant, and potential security risks. And this carries over into the post-war world when many of you have heard about the Lavender Scare when the government went after gay men and lesbians, but particularly gay men, as potential security risks, believing that they were too weak to stand up to communists and would become dupes, would be easily blackmailed. So this begins in World War II, and in a really strange twist, and for those of you interested in reception theory uh, in media studies, this is a still from one of the most, well, actually the most popular in terms of box office success, popular films of the war called This is the Army. Now, This is the Army was a co-production of Warner Brothers and the Office of War Information, which was the propaganda arm of the US government during World War II. Now, one of the themes going through this movie is a, is a romance between the, the star of the film, Ronald Reagan, and his girlfriend, who is a uh, nurse volunteer during, during the war. But there's also this play within a play that takes place throughout the whole thing. And during this performance, you have a ballet done by big, burly men in drag this scene. Now, why? Because the message in this film is, and there's, and there's also clips of um, comedian soldiers making jokes about female officers that they have to report to, a lot of gender-bending jokes, and then this, this uh, ballet in drag. And the message is, this is all just, you know, because it's wartime and it's not dangerous, it's a way, it's entertainment, it's just a way to kind of flip things around um, just for fun, just for fun. But it's not really serious, we don't have to worry about this. And so the message in this film is all about heterosexuality, all about heterosexuality. And here are some of the postcards that are reminiscent of this theme that were prevalent in World War II, reminding men of their sweethearts at home, and the climactic scene in the movie when the Reagan character marries his sweetheart. Um, the, the official doing the marriage is his commanding officer, and then he leaves to go overseas to fight. So this is the happy ending to the film that has this, this kind of gender-bending piece to it. Very popular film, a war propaganda film sponsored by the government to diffuse the fears of um, gender out of control or homosexuality because this is the happy ending and this is what it's all about. This is what they're all fighting for. So what happens with this film? It becomes a huge cult movie for gay men and lesbians during World War II. Huge. 
In fact, if some of you know the book by Alan Barabay called Coming Out Under Fire, there's an entire, it's about gays and lesbians during World War II, there's an entire chapter on this film alone. So, you know, if you think about the fact that this is a war propaganda film where a major Hollywood studio co-produces with the propaganda arm of the government a film that's meant to reinforce marriage, heterosexuality, appropriate gender roles. The nurse is a volunteer. She's not getting paid for her work. And he doesn't want her to work at all. But she says, I'm just volunteering to help take care of the wounded soldiers. And he relents, right? And this film becomes a cult film, um, delivering just the opposite message to what the producers were hoping for. But we see here a tension between what's really exploding around the edges of this normative sexual culture and what, what the government and, you know, the mainstream culture and the, you know, culture makers, if you will, are, are trying to keep a lid on during the war. Another nice example, I think, of the beginnings of a kind of baby boom in nuclear family culture that happens during World War II is another very popular film. This is a 1941 film called Penny Serenade. Um, starring major, major players at the time, Cary Grant and Irene Dunn, here pictured. Now, what is the plot here? The plot here is that this couple gets married, and uh, he is an adventurous journalist, and she is a playful homemaker, right? And through, you know, an accident, she can't have babies, and so they're desperately trying to adopt and they have to convince this stereotypically prudish social worker and also a judge that they are fit parents to adopt this child. Now, the whole film, the only really angelic, really um, romantic photography is focused on this child, not really on the couple, even though these are big romantic stars at the time, but on their effort to try to win approval. So the, so the the husband has to claim before a judge that he will stop his adventurous going around the world as a journalist and take a job, take a desk job where he's not at risk and he's not away from home and he can stay home and be the good husband and father and make, you know, a steady living. And that he's, he, he makes his speech before the judge saying, you know, he'll, he'll do it, he'll do anything, just let us adopt this child. And meanwhile, uh, the wife has to be the good wife, and this uh, social worker comes to visit the house. And when the social worker is coming, she immediately turns off the music where she's been dancing in the living room, and she picks up the vacuum cleaner and um, tones down her clothing and everything so that she's looking the part of the very respectable homemaker and wife. And in the end, they get the kid. So the whole plot is really about that. And I think that also tells you something about the beginnings of the baby boom during the war and the goal of soldiers coming back home and creating this domestic world. And there was a lot of fear that it wasn't going to happen. Fear that people weren't, especially women, were, were not wanting to get married because they had been working during the war and they enjoyed their independence. Fear th of another depression, so there'd be trouble supporting a family. And you begin to get, during the war, these films, popular, very popular films, that enshrine the nuclear family when and, and, the, uh, and the desire for children at a time when all of that seems to be actually threatened by what's happening in the world. So we begin to get a sense that personal fulfillment and satisfaction, and even sexual satisfaction, is gained through the nuclear family, particularly through marriage and childbearing. And you begin to get this interesting theme coming into the popular culture, that having babies is the fulfillment of women's sexuality. Not what it takes to have the babies, but having the babies themselves, right? So here is a feature in Life magazine called Model Mothers. And this particular article 
is focused on these young women who are married to soldiers who are abroad, but who have had children during the war when their husbands were away. I mean, their husbands had to have been back at some point, you know, or before they left to create these babies. But the point of this article was that these young mothers, these wives of servicemen, are very sexy in their motherhood. That having children does not detract from their beauty, does not detract from their professional standing as sexy, gorgeous models, in fact enhances it, you know. As we all know, you know, having a baby makes you more sexy. Well, that was really the message here. And the idea that motherhood was really the fulfillment of women's sexuality. And so you start to see a lot of messages like this and, and also in the prescriptive literature, advice columns to women uh, about having children as, their, as really the culmination of their womanhood. At the same time, you start to get a new vision of the homemaker and wife. So this is a telephone advertisement. And it, it begins to show you the ways in which the role of the homemaker wife, mother, homemaker, begins to expand into a kind of professional or multi-professional arena. So here, this is your wife. This is an advertisement, obviously, addressed to men. Um, your wife is a chef. She's a nurse. She's a chauffeur. Um, she's a glamorous companion when you go out at night. And she, has, she does all of these things for you as your spouse and that is her professional role. And this is also a time when, the, when women were reading lots of women's magazines that elevated the role of homemaker, not just to being a domestic drudge, but to having a professional uh, and important role to play within the family and therefore within the society at large. Now this was a very white middle class message. And the location of these nuclear families after World War II was most decidedly the suburbs. Now this is a, this is a picture of Levittown, um, one of several communities built by uh, the, the developer, William Levitt. And he was known for someone who, um, I guess the best way to put it is, to collapse class lines while sort of reinforcing race lines, racial lines. So Levittown offered inexpensive homes to working class white families so they could live the life of the middle class in the suburbs while maintaining se racial segregation and not allowing people of color into his communities. And when he was asked about that, he said, look, I'm just a developer. My job is to build homes, you know, to develop suburban communities. My job isn't to solve social problems. So the idea was that racial segregation was, you know, the default position, the status quo. And to create integrated housing was a kind of social experiment, something radical, something political. And that isn't what he did. And so these were the ways in which not only developers like Levitt, but policies like redlining uh, and, and other exclusionary policies uh, kept racial segregation going in, in the suburbs that were built after World War II. Now there were lots of suburban developments and one of the things I, I, I find interesting they are, many of them, very modest and affordable, so white working class families in the prosperous po post-war years could afford them. And they had a certain kind of look, a kind of privatized, inward-looking focus. You don't see the, even on a small scale, the front porches of either the urban urban apartments that had, you know, front doorsteps where people would sit and visit, or the old sort of bungalows that had 
porticos and porches in front. These are very internal kinds of houses. They don't speak to or interact with the public in that way. They are very private looking structures. And there were reasons for that too, that the family is really its own resource after World War II and that it's not advisable to be interacting with the public world all the time. And even the, the FHA, the, um, the Federal Housing Administration, which gave out loans to veterans, and in this case white veterans because black veterans couldn't, couldn't get the loans to buy in these communities, they were selling a lifestyle. And here you see it. What are they selling? They're selling the young white nuclear family and the lifestyle that goes with it. And the houses are kind of irrelevant. It's not the house itself that is being sold here, it's the lifestyle that goes with it. So, what does this have to do with the Cold War or with fear or with sex and women and the bomb? Well, the nation's leaders in both the US and the USSR understood it. And this is, some of you have heard of the kitchen debate that took place in 1959, the same year as the sheltered honeymoon, when Richard Nixon travels to the Soviet Union um, to appear with Nikita Khrushchev, the premier of the USSR, to tour the American exhibition that was there. One of these cultural exchange moments in the middle of the Cold War to show, well, we can somehow be friends, sort of. And what's interesting about the, the kitchen debate, a lot of things are interesting, is that these two guys did not debate who had the better form of government or who had the stronger rockets or missiles to reach outer space. They talked about who had the better washing machines and, and kitchen appliances and, and who had the better women. And they actually talked about that. So Khrushchev said, well, Nixon boasted about American women. We have our, our women, and he, uh, he would use the word women and housewives interchangeably. So he would say, our women, our housewives, live a good life because they don't have to worry about drudgery and hard work. They, their husbands support them, and they, they live in modern um, appliance-filled houses like this. And Khrushchev answered by saying, we don't share that capitalist view of women. Our women work side by side with their men on the factory floors and in the workplace, and we don't have this capitalist division of labor. Now what we know is, is that in both countries, men were the ones who worked in the, you know, in the workforce, and women were the ones who stayed home and took care of the, the home and family. But the rhetoric was very much about these different gender these different gender roles under the two systems. And they were fighting about this. And the way they finally resolved it was a waitress came in with wine or vodka or whatever they were drinking, and they, um, one of them said, oh well, let's raise our glass to the ladies, and gestured toward the, wa the waitress. And then, um, and then they said, yes, we can all drink to the ladies. And that's kind of how the argument ended. But in the exhibition itself, what you have is the American, the idealized American kitchen with all the appliances and the idealized American housewife. She's very glamorous, she's very tidy, she's very modest, she's wearing heels, she's wearing a dress, she's wearing a clean apron, the way all of us look when we're doing housework, right? And of course, the message was, as in this advertisement, that it's going to be the appliances that are going to free women to enjoy the good life. And here, too, she's, she's wearing her tidy little apron and her high heels and her dress the way we all look when we're swinging in swings next to our machines out in the backyard. <laughs> now, now, this is all one level of Cold War ideological debate that swirls around gender after World War II. And if we remember the bubbling up of dangerous sexuality during World War II and the effort to kind of clamp it down after the war, 
we can start to look at other images, some of them coming right out of the government, not just out of the popular or private media or newspapers and magazines. So I'm going to turn now to look at some of the messages coming out of the civil defense movement after World War II, the government bureaucracy that was set up to encourage Americans to protect themselves against the threat of atomic war. And this is an image from a civil defense pamphlet put out by the government. Grandma's pantry was ready. Is your pantry ready in the event of emergency? So what do we see here in Grandma's pantry? You can almost smell the cookies baking, right? It's very old-fashioned. It's got a very comforting look. And the text that went along with this was something like, uh, Grandma was ready in the event of an emergency or an unexpected visit from the minister at the church. Scary thought. Um, and, and so even the emergencies were described in a way that was, oh my gosh, I better get the cookies out of the oven and ha have the minister come and sit down and have a cup of tea. So you, you see here a kind of reference back to a moment of comforting domestic life, grandma's pantry, right? Now, in this very same pamphlet was a discussion of fallout. So you have the reassuring image here of grandma's pantry, and then you have a discussion of fallout. And the point was, well, you need to have these shelters because fallout can be dangerous. And it can be dangerous because it can actually get into your body through your skin and get under your skin and make you sick and potentially even kill you. So the pamphlet goes on to describe the composition of fallout for the average citizen who's reading this government pamphlet. And it describes the alpha, beta, and gamma rays that comprise fallout and what they can do to you. Now, how do you illustrate that? Well, you illustrate it, you can't because they're invisible, microscopic, not microscopic, they're atomic particles, they don't even show up under the microscope. microscope. So how do you, if you're in the government bureaucracy, in the civil defense bureaucracy, and you're putting together this pamphlet, how do you convey the danger of alpha, beta, and gamma rays? This is how. So what is the message here about these bathing beauties, alpha, beta, and gamma? Well, they're dangerous. They're dangerous, but this was also an era of the atom, atoms for peace, the idea that nuclear power could be harnessed, right, for good, for medicine, for uh, nuclear power. This was one of the things that Dwight Eisenhower was very committed to was atoms for peace, right? So you can, you can harness alpha, beta, and gamma. Here's the danger, but they can be harnessed, they can be married, they can become good wives and mothers. So the antidote is domesticity, marriage and family life, where you take these rays and they're, and they're exciting and they're dangerous, but you put them to good use, right? So about the same time, you start getting a lot of images in the popular culture that turn the terrifying possibilities of the atomic age into something sexy and explosive. So here we have the anatomic bomb, for example. The bathing beauty uh, looking half dead, or more than half dead, but nonetheless, the potential here, again, is the danger associated with female sexuality and its attraction, both. Now, we all know what a bikini bathing suit is, right? Anybody know where the bikini got its name? So there was, there was the designer of the bikini bathing suit, and he decided to call it the bikini because it was designed shortly after the test of the hydrogen bomb on the Bikini Island and uh, to reference the potentially explosive and dangerous nature of that 
moment of atomic and nuclear explosion, he named the swimsuit the bikini. And we continue to see these, these kinds of images, these kinds of messages floating through the culture well beyond the 50s and the 60s and 70s and even into the 80s. Now some of you, you're all probably uh, too young, most of you, to remember or have read about this, but uh, during the Reagan era there was a new burst of interest in nuclear weaponry and defense. Uh, Reagan was very interested in kind of reviving both the rhetoric of the Cold War and the military machinery. He proposed these, what came to be known as the Star Wars system that would be this shield that would block uh, incoming missiles. And as a response to that, there was a uh, nuclear freeze movement that began in the 1980s and, um, and kind of sparked a new interest in discussing the impact of the atomic age and atomic danger after it had been kind of pushed aside by other issues in the 60s and 70s that seemed to kind of put the fear of, of atomic attack in the background. So it comes back, and it comes back again in interesting ways that, it, that start to reassociate atomic age dangers with the dangers of female sexuality. So here, for example, is a Bloom County cartoon that was published in 1983. Now this is at the same time as the nuclear freeze movement. And it's also at the same time as the revival of Cold War rhetoric and atomic age um, military weaponry and the arms race. So here we have Bloom County, a popular, popular cartoon at the time in newspapers. And here we have the hapless hero sleeping and suddenly his bedroom is invaded during a nightmare, of course, he's asleep. Well, hello over there, handsome. I'm Norma the Nuke, big boy. Just wanted you to know that I'll be coming for you someday. And the poor hapless hero in his dream wakes up and says, me, but I'm only a kid. And Norma the Nuke says, honey, I'll take them all, young, old, military, civilian. Old Norma ain't exactly discriminating if you catch my, me my me message, if you catch my meaning. And then the poor guy says, that's, that's immoral. And Norma the Nuke says, oh, ain't it so? And then, the next day we get the continuation and he's still waking in his nightmare and saying, you can skip the suck lines, Miss Norma. Miss Norma the Nuke, I know your type. And your promises. You seduce us into blissful complacency and then, when we least expect it, whammo, you take everything leaving a scorched wasteland of broken lives. Well, hit the road, baby, I don't need the heartache. And then Norma the Nuke says to him, lover, all you tough guys would beat each other's throats if it wasn't for my calming presence. Ooh. And then she leaves and he says, nukes, you can't live with them, you can't live without them. An old saying about women that men used to toss around. Women, you can't live with them, you can't live without them. So even well into the 80s, you're getting this strange association between atomic danger and the danger of female sexuality. Now I'm going to end with an image that I think is really interesting also from the 1980s. Now at the same time that there was this debate going on about whether or not to pursue a new arms race, and you have the nuclear freeze movement emerging to combat that idea, you also had the first major debates 
about whether or not advertisements for condoms should be aired on television in an effort to stop the spread of AIDS. And that was a big debate in the 1980s when AIDS was devastating so many, in, particularly in the gay community. And the question was, should these censorship rules be lifted to allow for the advertisement of condoms on television? And a cartoonist from the Los Angeles Times came up with this. The caption says, speaking of the need for condoms, and there is a missile. So he, he sees the two as, in some ways, related to each other, and this was his commentary. Now, I, I actually met this cartoonist at the Los Angeles Times. Back then, I was doing some book reviewing for them, and it was in a lunchroom, and he was friends with the book review editor and called him over, and we talked about this, and he, I asked him about it, and he said, yeah, he said, uh, now this guy won Pulitzer Prizes and things like that. He was a very distinguished political cartoonist. And he said, yeah, he said, in all my many years at the LA Times, I've never been censored except once. And he said, this was not my first choice for this, for this cartoon. The first choice for, for this cartoon that I submitted was a missile wearing a condom. And the editor of the LA Times said, oh no, can't do that. And it was the first time he was told to redo a cartoon, so he did this with the caption instead. The one before had no caption, it was just sort of speaking for itself. So I think that it's quite interesting that there's this combination of fear and thrill, excitement and danger, sexual titillation and, and possibility of annihilation that all gets mixed up in the atomic age and may tell us something about both the response to the early years of the atomic age and the response to a new awakening and display of female sexuality in the culture more broadly. Somehow or other, they were both seen as exciting and dangerous and potentially really life-threatening. So I think I'll just leave you with that. Maybe we can spend a little bit of time with um, you know, some discussion. Does this resonate with anything in Canada? Yes, please. Uh, 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 you mentioned it has uh, 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 planning standards in it, uh, sort of the first uh, association with female uh, sexuality, so to uh, danger, uh, something that, uh, you know, uh, worships. I uh, used to be referred to as her, but she uh, had female names as well. Yes, I think you're right, it does. Nonetheless, I looked at some of the iconography from World War I, and it was much more domestic. You'd have pictures of women, but you wouldn't have pictures of women in these sexy poses or naked women. Um, it was more like, this is what we're fighting to protect. And not really, this is the equivalent kind of danger. We love it and we're going to use it, but, you know, we understand this is dangerous and female sexuality represents the kind of danger that we represent as bombers, you know. We're going to let loose on our enemy and female sexuality could be potentially as devastating to an unsuspecting um, man who's overwhelmed by it as, um, as our enemies are by our, by our bombs and weapons. But yeah, that's a very good question because there is a lot of iconography of uh, womanhood during wartime especially. 
And of course, the pinups, that was another thing, during, especially during World War II, in the, in the bunkers of where men would put up pictures of their wives and sweethearts, and often in poses that resembled sexy movie stars and things like that. Yes? Great question, thank you for that. So, what, what goes on with black women at this time is fascinating, because just as the white middle class is re-domesticating women, black women, for the first time, because of the potential for decent wages for black men after World War II, because there is prosperity, and that is, that is reaching the black families as well as white families, even though these families were mostly not allowed into the suburbs, but for many black couples and families, for the first time, the husband earned enough to provide for the family, and the wife could come home and take care of her own family and her own children instead of working in the families of white people. And there's a wonderful article in Ebony Magazine from this time called Goodbye Mammy, Hello Mom, which was all about how black women could now function as the homemaker wife mother in their own homes rather than the servant in other families and could take care of their families. Meanwhile, of course, Ebony and other magazines like Jed and other African American magazines are filled with articles about professional black women and how, unlike white women, there were places for black women to enter into the paid labor force largely in black businesses or schools, but nonetheless with respected positions because, why? Because black women had always worked outside the home. And this was nothing new. But their opportunities had changed after World War II. Their opportunities at home as well as in the paid labor force. Thirdly, we get the Civil Rights Movement. Organized and led and fired up largely by black women. Black women had relatively little to lose in becoming political activists unlike white women who did have a lot to lose by becoming political activists. And even so, white women got involved in things like Women's Strike for Peace, which was an anti-nuclear movement, and other activities at the time that challenged the kind of Cold War mentality. But black women risked their lives, just like black men did, to resist particularly in the South, segregation and get involved in the civil rights movement as leaders. And they had much more at stake. Um, so it's a, it's a big difference. They're becoming political, they're activists, they're challenging the authorities, they're resisting the culture that dictated that they were destined to be maids in white people's families on all levels. They were sort of freed from this white middle class good life that in many ways really restricted white women in terms of what they could do. Black women had very little to lose by challenging all of that. So thank you for that question. Yes? Um, do you think, um, um, with the emphasis on the sexualization of women in the community and things like that, do you think that could possibly represent a crisis in masculinity? Oh, <laughs> oh yes. Do, do I think that it represents a crisis in ma masculinity? Yes. And what's interesting is that in the 1950s, uh, the largest and loudest complaints against the restricted gender roles were much more coming from men. Men were writing in journals, academic men, um, you have the, the organization men, you have the, um, you have the lonely crowd, you have men writing about the the lack of, really the lack of freedom and individual fulfillment 
that they're facing because they have to work in big organizations, they have to take these boring jobs in order to earn enough to provide for their families. They are humiliated when their women take jobs, when their wives take jobs, but they need the extra income because the pressure on them is so intense. Um, so the men are complaining at the time that the expectations for manhood have really been restricted since World War II, and they felt very boxed in, quite literally in many cases, into these you know, bureaucratic institutions where they just push papers around all day and there was really no satisfaction in their work. They go home, they're told to be good daddies and, and to get out the tools and fix the house. And they, they felt very restricted and, and very emasculated through all of this. And you, you don't hear that coming from women in a big way until Betty Friedan in 1963 comes out with the feminine mystique. So yes, absolutely, this is about a crisis in masculinity that men were actually talking about at the time. And I saw a hand over here, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> and, uh, and I don't I really think there are very few books that I read as an undergraduate that I can give to undergraduates today and know that they will find it interesting and compelling. And Homer Brown is absolutely one of them, one of the very few books that that's true of them. And so my question is sort of about how, uh, how this era, the really cool work, gets remembered. Because I think the reason I didn't have Homer Brown to a student today, and the reason I still do my Such a great question, and thank you so much for um, your appreciation of, of this book, which this talk obviously is drawn from. Well, I, you're absolutely right, and, and I make this argument also in the book, that the 1950s, we'll call it the long 1950s, you know, 1945 to 65, was a very unusual time in American history, in 20th century history. And it was sort of um, a moment where all of the fears of the age were focused on really how, how do you deal with all of these fears? What do we do as a society to assuage these fears? How do we respond to the atomic age, to the new uncertainties about gender roles to the realities of the Cold War and communism and all of these other things. How do we respond? And the answer, and there's, I think, a lot of reasons for this answer, and I'm not sure I fully answer it as to why, but it, it turned to the home. And there were political reasons for that, personal reasons for that, a sense that the country had been through two major upheavals, depression and war, and American men and women were ready to kind of hunker down for a variety of reasons. And this came to have a kind of life of its own. Even at the time, the popular culture celebrated it with 
you know, popular sitcoms like Ozzie and Harriet and Leave it to Beaver and all these iconic shows about the white middle class family and father knows best and father always knows best but the woman is always the, the wise one who, um, who really knows how to keep the family whole and healthy. And it begins to take on a life of its own even as it became completely questioned and criticized during the 60s and the 70s with the, you know, all the social upheavals and political activism and movements of those years. At the same time that that is moving forward, there is a parallel backlash against those efforts to undermine this domestic culture. And so it was never a consensus. It was always a tension between this ideal that was very brief and very limited. You know, it was a white middle class suburban ideal that even the white middle class suburbanites mostly didn't live up to. You know, it was a fantasy. But fantasies have a way of having a life of their own. And even when it became obvious that the, you know, the walls were cracking of the domestic 1950s suburban home in, in more ways than one, it held on as, a, as somehow an ideal that was reached briefly and then fell apart. So in the political battles and culture wars that unfolded since, you have those who are defending that ideal and those who are challenging it without ever really asking, first of all, did it ever happen and did it ever work? Did it ever really make people happy? Was it a satisfying ideal? And, you know, I think we're still fighting those battles. But it's a great question, thank you. And I, I, don't, I don't think I fully have answered it even all these years later when I've revised the book and everything and I'm always drawn back, <laughs> I shouldn't confess this in public, but I'm always drawn back to my beloved um, research and writing group with my friends and colleagues through those years when we would get together every week in the same place, at the same time, and talk about our work and my friends just, I was working on this book just saying, you haven't really hammered down the why. And like, finally I just went to press. <laughs> I just never did really hammer down the why. I've been puzzling over it ever since. So thank you. I think your question is very well merited. Thanks. There was a certain, is this on? Yeah. yeah. There was a certain group of women during the war that stayed behind and built those same wartime houses, worked in the bomb factories, worked in the munition factories, engineers or designers, architects, workers, laborers, whatever happened to that group? Great question. Thank you for that question. What happened to all the women who had these very high-powered jobs during the war? Well, there's actually a terrific film, if any of you can see it. It's a very old film by now, but I've used it a lot in classes called uh, The Life and Times of Rosie the Riveter. And it it is interviews with many of these wartime workers. And what happened, you can maybe remember back to that slide where it showed the, the percentage of married women who continued to be in the paid labor force after the war. Well, for many of these women, they loved their jobs during the war, and they wanted to keep working, and they did. But many of them had to give up those kinds of jobs that you described as engineers, architects, you know, all kinds of professions that had not been open to women before. But they were kind of forced out in an effort to allow men to come back and fulfill their proper roles, not only in the family, but in the, in the workplace. And these were the years when you get um, a lot of restrictions on uh, how many and what percentage of women would be allowed into professional schools, medical schools, law schools, you started actually getting quotas with the idea that we don't want to open the doors too much to women. We really have to get men back into their rightful place because World War II had opened up so many avenues to women, also in the military, 
as well as in um, the domestic labor force and professional uh, ranks. So there was a lot of worry that, first of all, that the men would come back and they wouldn't get jobs and there'd be another depression and that if they did get jobs, they wouldn't get the kind of jobs that would allow them to support families and take their rightful place as, uh, as the breadwinners in their families. And thirdly, that they would come back so broken and, and suffering what was then called shell shock, we call it PS, uh, PTSD now, um, that they would just fall apart. How do we build up men and allow them back into, um, in, into their rightful place? There's a fabulous film, if you've never seen it, I hope you've all seen it, um, The Best Years of Our Lives. How many people have seen Best Years? Oh good, a few of you have. If you haven't, it's, it's a magnificent 1946 film um, about the men coming home from war, how their world has changed, and they're all broken. One of them has lost his, his hands in the war. Another one is a... Um, is an alcoholic and, and can't really function as a proper father and, and husband to his family that has changed so much. Uh, and the third one was a soda jerk and his wife who he married right before the war um, who was enamored with his uniform has been cheating on him and walks out on him and the um, the drugstore where he was the soda jerk has been bought up by a by a corporation that now brings in you know guys half his age to uh, to do the job that he used to do and so they're all coming back broken and they find their lives are turned upside down and it's the women who really restore them to their manhood and their strength and their ability to cope and so you begin to see how wives and in this case sweethearts who then become wives are, are the ones who are rescuing the men and allowing them to take over their rightful place through their own strength and uh, and their own ability emotional ability to restore the men um, the broken men to fullness and masculinity. So, you know, you see still the popular culture addressing some of these questions. These women had jobs during the war and they stepped back after the war to make space for their men and their job is to heal the men in this film. And it's, it's a remarkable film. I, it, it won all the Academy Awards of 1946 and it still makes me cry, I admit. It's a tearjerker when, especially a scene where the sweetheart of the guy who lost his arms, and he was a real war veteran who had never acted before and he lost his arms. He went on to have a career in Hollywood, but it was his first acting job. And he's trying to tell his sweetheart that he was too helpless to marry her. She would be faced with taking care of him and his disability for the rest of his life. And they go upstairs and he takes off his hooks and everything and says, now look, I'm helpless, I can't even close the door, I can't even put on my pajamas, and of course she puts on his pajamas and buttons them and she says, I love you, I've always loved you, I'll always love you, and you know. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's a story of how the women cope with the broken men and restore them and the relationships and the family. So, you know, again, it's a, um, you know, it's a movie, what can I say, but it spoke to the moment. And, um, and we see it in the demography of the post-war world when women continue to work, but they move out of those particular jobs they had in the war to make space for the men, but they stay in the paid labor force, in the, in, really in the pink collar world. Well, well, I see there's refreshments in the back. Yes, uh, and not only refreshments. Well, thank you very thank much. Thank you. Thank you. You're a great audience. Thanks for the great questions. Uh, three things. Uh, yes, one is we will be having something to drink and something to eat. You're welcome to join us. Two, come back tomorrow. Uh, at 2.30, you will be speaking about the quest for security, fear and its consequences. And three, if you don't have Fortress America, which is 
Professor May's most recent book, thanks to the bookstore, we have, what a coincidence, uh, copies there. And I think you might even be willing to sign them. If anyone's willing to buy them, I'm willing to sign them. <laughs> Very good. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Good